soil, lives will be touched in the name of Jesus. Father God, we'll get to know who we are in Christ, and we'll get to understand this wonderful gospel. Yeah. And we praise you for it and thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, if you've been coming, we've been studying the gospel according to Paul. I'm just changing the title to the gospel. All right. And we looked at the life of Paul, which I thought was pretty interesting, and how God showed him a system of truth. And that's really what we're looking at for the last while, the system of truth, as God revealed it to the Apostle Paul. Then we looked at the, our spirit, that we are a spirit, we have a soul, we live in a body. And then the third time, the third thing we looked at was our identification with Adam. Okay? How uh, we identified with him because he committed the unpardoned, uh, the high treason. Fourth, we looked at our condition in Adam, where we were in Adam. Uh, last week, we looked at what happened from the, to Jesus from the cross to the throne. Well, not last week, Pastor Eddie taught last week. And then tonight, we're going to look at our identification with Christ from a little bit different standpoint. And uh, that might take a couple of Wednesday nights. And then we're going to clean up this thing with, uh, we're going to talk about who we are and what we have in Christ. Now, these things are pretty important. You know, I call it, and, and my wife says you shouldn't say that, but it's Christianity 101. It's one of the things that we've learned way on in the beginning when we had gotten, when we first had gotten saved, was who we are in Christ. All right, the authority of the believer, uh, and and I think a lot of people, a lot of churches, ministers, whatever, have shied away from teaching that because it with it brought a lot of controversy. And we want to teach things that are make feel good sermons. Right. And uh, I like to say, listen, if you want to be a success, this is the way we got to go. Right. We got to find out who we are in Christ. And uh, so Romans chapter six. Let me get there. I, want to, I have a couple extra verses I want to look at. Romans chapter six, and let's just start in verse one. It says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? You know, the book of Romans is a book of, about grace. Certainly not. How shall, we, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know, as as many were baptized into Christ, Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in, likeness, in the likeness of his death, certainly we are also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing that this, our old man, was crucified with him, that the body of sin be done away with, and that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. So that's what I want to talk about just a little bit tonight. The old man versus the new man, which is really important. And, you know, when Jesus died on the cross, Paul says that when, when Jesus died on the cross, our old man, the person you were before you were born again, was crucified with him. The old man, the body of sin, the, the, the sin nature. See, the sin nature that was inside of us, in our spirit, has been done away with. Now, you still have the nature of the flesh. Your flesh isn't redeemed yet, okay? And so what's going to happen now is like, you know, we, we looked at this, and we the first, second or third lesson, we looked at our spirit, our soul, and our body. You have a spirit. You're a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. The thing that got instantly sanctified and set apart was your spirit. When you received Jesus Christ, the old man in your spirit was totally made a new man. That's why the Bible tells us we have to let the new man that's on the inside manifest itself on the outside. And that is a, the problem. Okay? Because your mind is being renewed, or it should be being renewed every day, to the Word of God. Amen. All right? But as we renew our mind, uh, your body, you have to deal with it from now till you go home to be with the Lord. It's not redeemed. Okay? It's not even close to being redeemed. 
the thing that helps you overcome the flesh is the renewing of your mind and getting your spirit to get the right communication to your mind and your mind overtaking your flesh. Amen? You got Amen. that? Amen. Sounds simple, don't it? Well, I wish it was a little simpler than it sounds. But, and, and, and that's a point, point three. It represents the old man that was in Adam, the sin. It's the sin nature. And, and, and everything that Adam produced was crucified with Christ. Everything that Satan did in Adam was reversed in Christ Jesus. So, as I think it was, uh, I don't know, I heard a preacher say, Jesus reversed the curse. Amen. See, we're no, un, no longer under the curse. The reason we're under the curse, we allow ourselves to be there. And we don't have to be there. So your old man's been crucified with Christ, okay? And, and then, and if that's the case, then you're dead to sin. Not only are you dead to sin, you're free from sin. Verse uh, 11 says, Likewise also reckon yourselves dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And the word reckon, you know, is uh, simply an accounting term that means consider it done. It's done. It's a done deal. You don't have to go over and, re and do it over again. It goes, reckon yourselves dead. You're, it's done. Amen. Consider it done. All right? Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Turn there. It says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I... The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, people look at that from the natural standpoint. But this is a spiritual st statement here that we're looking at. You were not there at Calvary. Okay? Jesus and two thieves were there. We weren't there. So we have to reckon ourselves like we were there. Our old man has been crucified with him. Our old man was crucified with Christ. You know, people are influenced by the God of this world. We're, 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 we're influenced by the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. People are controlled by fame, fortune, and prestige. That's the way of the world, whether you like it or not. Even in the realm of Christianity, people are influenced by fame, fortune, and prestige. Amen. Who do I know? How could I get friendly with this one? You know, in all the years, we've been saved 40 years. I never tried to be friendly. I mean, I'm a friendly guy, okay? But I was never... To th God would put me in, in, in with people like that would... I don't know how I got there. It had to be God, you know. Uh, I, I remember the, how we really be, became close with the Hagans. And it was, we were in Bible school and we were walking from the school to the gym. They didn't have the gym then. They had the roller skate. Right? And the Nowski sent him. And Ken Jr. come pulling up on a, on a golf cart. He said, hop on, I'll give you a ride. You know what? I didn't, I was like... <laughs> you know and so God always put me in the, somehow got me into these places praise God but there are people that look for fame fortune and prestige but we're talking about the world because the Bible says we're dead to the world okay but uh, and, and they're trying to be somebody in the world and Paul said you died to the world why do we want to emulate the world you know remember we have the the, the show, the lifestyles of the rich and famous. Oh, yeah. And people want to emulate that stuff. You know, it's nice to dream about it, but you know what? You're going to be walking on streets of gold, man. You got a mansion in heaven. Amen. Not these houses they have now, make mansions. <laughs> they're all the same. You're in the real estate business, they're make mansions. Yep. They're all 6,000 square feet, and they all look... It's just like being in a retirement village, but with big houses. Think about it. See, we're alive to God. One translation says this about Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I consider myself as having died, 
and now enjoying a sec second existence, which is simply Jesus in my body. Amen. Amen. I like that. Yeah. Jesus Amen. in my body. And, and so it gives us a little bit of different of, 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 uh, picture of Christianity than what, was, than what we generally see today, what we see being dished out different places. It's no longer me that lives, but Christ living in me, Jesus using me. The old me is dead. See, the old me would not think nothing, wouldn't think twice of smacking you. Just a right, seriously, writing you off. I mean, just punching you out. That's the old man. Now I have to put up with you. <laughs> the old man is dead. And so Jesus is useless. Amen. You know. <laughs> Philippians chapter 1 verse 21 again says, For me to live is Christ. He's not only saying reckon yourselves dead to sin, but reckon yourselves alive. To God. Amen. <coughs> Romans chapter 6 verse 11 says, also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin. All right? So, here's what I want to just say to you. You were not only crucified with Christ, but you died with Christ. You not only died with Christ, but you were buried with Christ. You were not only buried with Christ, but you were quickened and made alive in him. But well, you're not only made alive in him and quickened, but you were raised with him. Not only were you raised with him, you, uh, but, but you were seated with him yes. in heavenly places. You're not only seated with him, but you have authority of, of the resurrection and his power. And you are triumphant in him. These are the things you have simply because you received Jesus as your savior. Now, if you don't know you have this, it doesn't do you any good. Amen. You know, we're not staying at the cross. There's a song I like. It's an old song. At the cross. At the, you know what the problem is? People go to the cross and they never move. They stay at the cross. Oh, brother, you've got to come to the cross. Let's go to the cross. And they're hanging at the cross. They're just loving the cross. I love the cross too. But you've got to go through the cross. In order to get to the throne... You need to go through the cross. Amen. You need to take what Jesus did in the cross and make it your own. And then there are people who want to go right to the throne. They don't make it either. Amen. You need to go through the cross and then you get to the throne. All right? You need to do that. But don't hang at the cross, okay? So many I, I just, I, I don't want to go there. All right? Because I hear sermons about how, I, brother, just go. You got a problem? Just go sit at the foot of the cross. The cross not there no more. You know, I, I was going to do a sermon Sunday. And it was a, there's always types and shadows in the Old Testament. Okay? And we had to find something about <coughs> communion and types and shadows. And there was a thing. See, the cross, when they were in the wilderness, they, the waters were bitter. If you remember the story in Exodus, the waters were bitter. They called the place Mirabar. And they cut the tree down and threw it in the middle of the water, and it became sweet. So there we have a shadow of the cross of Jesus coming into our lives in totally changing it. Amen. My point being, the cross is cut down. Amen. Okay, nothing with the symbol of the cross. Right? Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying, you know, throw your crosses out. I'm just saying, we need to move on into the better things that Christ has for us. Or we just stay on this, uh, what is it, when the mouse goes on the wheel? Yeah. Treadmill. Treadmill, thank you. All right. So, we're not just seated. We're not just seated with Christ. We're blessed in Christ. Every one of us are blessed. All right? Romans chapter 8, verse 16 and 17 goes on to say this. The Spirit, Spirit himself, that's the Holy Spirit, bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Amen. And if children of God, then heirs. 
heirs and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Now let me tell you about the suffering there. It's, not, it's talking about the ridicule and the stuff that people give us because we call ourselves Christians. Okay, you don't have to go hang on a cross. All right? You know? And, and so this is our identity with Christ. We identify with Jesus. I've been crucified, and it's no longer me that lives, but Christ living in me. Now, with that being said, we should be doing, we should be doing pretty good if Christ himself lives in me. Amen. Am I right? Amen. I mean, last time I looked, Jesus is triumphant. Jesus is the master. He's the boss. He conquered the devil. He conquered the world, yeah. and he conquered the flesh. Yeah. Now, people look at that as theology, <clears throat> you know. I look at it as reality. These are things Jesus did. He's trium triumphant. So if he's triumphant, I should be triumphant. Amen. If he's the master of the situation, I should be the master of the situation yeah. in my life. Yeah. You know, if he conquered the devil, the devil should not be conquering me. I should be conquering the devil. Yeah, absolutely. I should be able to conquer the flesh. I should be able to conquer the world. You know? And so, don't look at it as theology. It's not theology. It's reality. <coughs> and if you think too much about it, you'll never figure it out anyway. Well, you need to take it at face value. You know, by faith. Just the way Paul said it. It's not a magical mystery tour. Just... Take it by faith. I'll never forget when we first got saved and I would listen to Ken Copeland on television. He said some things. I said, well, might as well try it. Everything else wasn't working. I'm just going to believe by faith. You know, he'd come up with these Texas isms in, which were foreign to me. And it's so funny because if I go to Tulsa sometimes, I haven't done it in years, but I would speak in classes. I had New Jerseyisms. They were lost. I had a friend of mine, Bill Bush, got home to be with the Lord. I was out there at a meeting. He said, do my, do my pastor's third year class. I said, boy, it's kind of short notice. He says, tell him the difference about the cultures in the United States. Like you're in the Northeast, you have people living in Alabama and Texas, places like that. I said, "What's it? How am I going to do this?" So there used to be a commercial on television when the Texan walked. It was a Budweiser beer commercial. The Texan walks in, and and he walks in the bar. And he's got the hat on, everything. He's walking around. And he goes, "How you all doing? How you all doing?" All of a sudden, one guy sitting at the end of the bar goes, "How you doing?" <laughs> so I put that clip. On TV, I says, now I want to explain to you the difference in cultures in the United States. And every one of you are going to get this. And I put that. And the place cracked up and I pulled it out. I said, class over. <laughs> <laughs> Bill says, you're crazy. <laughs> I said, well, it worked, didn't it? <laughs> That's right. People are called to different places. And I'll never forget one time we were in, in school. I was an usher. And... Uh, I, I was ushering and I was by the front door and this kid come up and he goes, Oh, glory, you got some people get, you know, they get broke. Glory to God, hallelujah, praise the Lord, I'm going to Harlem. And me and this other kid from the Northeast and we're going, Yeah, man. He goes, Yeah, I'm going to Harlem, brother. I'm going to go evangelize Harlem. And he's strutting back and forth. There's a little white kid about this big. I said, God tell you to go to Harlem? He said, What do you mean? I said, Because if God didn't tell you to go to Harlem, you ain't going to make it a day in Harlem, my friend. <laughs> right? Amen. I said, you ain't going to make it a day in Harlem. God didn't tell you. If he told you to go, not a problem. But if you just think it's a good idea, you better make sure it's a God idea, my friend. Because the cultures are different. He just, me and this kid, we burst his bubble. He just, all of a sudden, got real quiet. <laughs> I say nothing no more. I don't know if you ever went to Harlem. I don't think you ever made out a broken arrow. But, uh, anyway. And then you hear sermons about the cross. 
And the preacher always identifies everyone with the crowd. Did you ever notice that? They identify you with the Roman soldier. That was you. They identify you with the disciples. Or somebody else yelling and screaming in the middle of the crowd. Paul didn't identify with the crowd. Paul identified with Christ. That was us on that cross. So I was, but those kind of sermons didn't make people feel good. But the truth of the matter is, Jesus. We identify with Jesus Christ. That's what puts us over. Amen? Amen. Paul said, I was crucified, and now I live. Amen. 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 Here's the message Bible from Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 and 21. I identified myself completely with him. Indeed, I have been crucified with Christ. My ego is no longer central. It is no longer important that I appear righteous before you and have your good opinion. I am no longer driven to impress God. Christ lives in me. The life you see me living is not mine, but is lived by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Man, that, I'm going to read that again. That was good, wasn't it? I did, identified myself completely with him. Indeed, I have been crucified with Christ. My ego is no longer central. In other words, it's not about me. I know I am no, it is no longer important that I appear righteous before you. See, I don't worry about appearing righteous before people. Because I... I'm righteous. And have your good opinion. <laughs> wow. And I'm no longer driven to impress God. Christ lives in me. Can't beat that up. Man. The devil still can't figure it out though. You know that? He can't. If, you know, he knew God had a plan to redeem man. He just didn't know when it was going down. Or how it was going down. 1 Corinthians says, chapter 2, verse 8, if Satan knew he would be, if Satan knew, he would have not crucified the glory, Lord of glory. He wouldn't have done it. So when Satan stung Jesus with death, Jesus basically took the stinger out. And there's no more sting to death. He dethroned Satan, he dethroned the devil, and he had dethroned the power of death in our life. I mean, we're going to die physically unless the rapture comes, but we're going to spend eternity in heaven. Those that don't have Christ are dead. They're dead already, and they're going to spend eternity in hell. Because the covenant that we have with God is legal as it they can be, because of what Jesus did because of the incarnation of Jesus. When, when Jesus came into this earth, he put on flesh, born of a woman, and he legally became our substitute. Amen. By putting on the flesh, by being born of a woman, by becoming a human being, he could pay the price. Amen. Couldn't be done any other way. That's why the Bible says in Romans chapter 5, he became the second eye, Adam. And, and it was the plan from the beginning in the garden. God revealed how it would happen. Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. God said that the seed of the woman, Jesus, would bruise the serpent, Satan's head. Prophecy. First prophecy right out of the box. Oh yeah? Look out. Your time is coming. Satan, you didn't learn your lesson when I threw you out? You tried to destroy it again. The day is coming when you'll be literally powerless to do anything. Jesus died for everybody. All mankind. I can't stress that point enough. He died for everybody. And since he died for everybody, those that receive him have died in him too. Even those that did receive him, but they're not in him. They've never received him. 
And it says, for the love of God compels us. The love of Christ compels us. Because we judge this, that if one man died for all, then all died. Think about it. That's why it's so important to tell people about Jesus. I mean, there's a world out there going nuts. I mean, all right? Jesus didn't die to prove he can conquer the devil. Let me tell you, that was no match. It was odd. Jesus died to conquer the devil. No. He could have conquered the devil. He, the way he did it, becoming a man, is so that it could be accomplished for all mankind. God could have whacked the devil anytime he wanted to. But that wouldn't have helped you. And then Jesus wouldn't have had a real test if he came down here. He won the victory as a human. And that's what makes it so great. It wasn't the Godhead that won. It was Jesus that won. And he won for us. And we can't ever forget that. And, and really, understanding our identification, our identity with Christ, is the center of the gospel. That's the good news. You know, Paul, he, you know, Paul had a radical identity change in his life. God changed his name from Saul to Paul, all right? And, and, it, and, and he said, it, it, it's not God changed him, it's not even me living no more, it's Christ living through me. Amen. How many of you ever heard about the Witness Protection Program? Amen. I'm sure you all have. Amen. All right. You know, you testify against someone in the FBI, all of a sudden they give you a new identity. Yeah. Your old identity is wiped out. Okay? And they give you a new one, they relocate you, give you a new social security number, your credit is a thousand, you know, all your records are erased, you're a new person. Amen. Amen. Am I right? Yeah, that's it. I mean, you watch those programs. Yeah. See, when you receive Jesus Christ, the same thing happens. You became a new creation. Hallelujah. Your whole life has been erased. And you've been relocated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Amen. Hallelujah. The problem is there are some knuckleheads in the witness protection programs, in the natural, that got to call somebody from their old life. And they usually get whacked. Yep. So in the spiritual side, we got some people in the witness protection program that want to keep going and play with the devil and get whacked. <laughs> Same scenario. See, that's the stuff they don't get out in Oklahoma. Anyway, <laughs> you know, but as you feed on the word of God, you, be, you, you begin to say, I'm not that same person anymore. You know, the more you feed on it, the more God becomes real to you, the more you don't want to go back to that old life. Amen. The devil's been after you for years. It, but God wiped it all out. You got no past. You do realize that. Everything that was against you has been taken away. Everything. You know, there's an old thing it's called the giving of the double. All right? And if you read Psalm 103, you know, we always, when we do communion, we read that. And we never really get down to verse 12. But in verse, it tells you about, you know, uh, he's redeemed our life from destruction. And, and you get to verse 12 and it says, he talks about our sins. And as far, as far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. You know, east and west never meet. Do you 